The Lounge, proudly brought to you by Johnny Walker. Keep walking. Hi, welcome to The Lounge. My name is Kweku Sechiado. The Lounge is brought to you by Johnny Walker. Keep walking. This is a special edition of the program, and my guest is Ms. Bozuma St. John, the Global Marketing Chief of Uber, the global marketing company. Bozuma St. John is Ghanaian American. Her father was a minister in the government of President Liman, that's Dr. Apienda Arthur. She was born in the United States, spent some time in Ghana and in Kenya, but has spent most of her time in the United States. But as we'll hear tonight, her essence really is Ghanaian. She's going to talk to us about her life, her work, her upbringing, and what has brought her to the pinnacle of the corporate rooms in Silicon Valley. Welcome to the lounge. While you've been here, um, have you been riding an Uber? <laughs> of course, yes. Okay, what are the drivers like? Uh, they're enterprising, they are very passionate, um, they want five stars on every ride, which is great. Um, and they've been very informative. Objective you know? assessment. What was that? Objective assessment. Yes, yes, they've been very informative about what works and what doesn't work and um, how pleased they are with the opportunity and that they want us to do more, which has been actually very encouraging to me personally. Tell me about the Uber model. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is Uber? So it is a movement application, which is about getting people, things, opportunities from place to place. Um, I think at its very basis, it's about getting someone an opportunity to create a business of their own. That's first and foremost. Second, about moving communities from place to place. And then third, about the development of what the future of all of our entertainment, transportation, pop culture, all the things that you want to see and do and uh, interact with in your daily life will be powered and moved by Uber. And what attracted you from all the great things you were doing at Apple to switch? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, I think on the very, at the very basis of it, uh, Uber is a future company. You know, it is where the world is going. It is how technology is impacting not just what we do every day, but how we do it. And that, for me, as I look at you know, the world of Silicon Valley and corporate America and the larger world in general, uh, from a corporate and business standpoint, there are lots and lots of ways in which communities are being shaped. And I felt very strongly that Uber has a very large part of how that's going to look. And I want to be a part of that. I want to be helpful in shaping that. And if I can be so bold in saying that, uh, obviously, I'm Ghanaian. Um, I have a biased interest in Africa, and I want to make sure that as the world moves, Africa moves along with it. And you can only really do that if there are people who, are, who have the seats at the table and who have that interest and can voice it. And so for me, that's part of the reason why I'm so excited every time I'm in a company in which I can help to advance uh, the mission of whatever the enterprise is. Uh, but in this particular case, we have so many implications um, as it relates to our African communities, our cities, our commerce, uh, and I want to make sure to be able to enhance that as well. And then secondly, I think representation matters. You know, being a woman, first of all, in corporate America or Silicon Valley and being a senior seat um, is rare. Uh, being a black woman at that is even rarer. And then being a Ghanaian black <laughs> woman is the rarest. <laughs> and so I want to represent us. I want to explore that a little further, a bit further down the road. 
So did you call Uber did, or did Uber call you? Ooh, that's a really good question. You know, it was almost exactly a year ago, actually, that it almost feels like it was called into being. You know, I was uh, coming, I was going from um, my vacation with some girlfriends. Uh, some of you may have seen on Instagram, on, I'm on vacation with some friends now. <laughs> um, and I was headed back to LA, uh, and a friend invited me to a, what he called the cool kids dinner in Las Vegas at CES. And so I said I would stop over for one night. It was a cool kids dinner. It was basically all the movers and shakers. Oh, all right. You know, okay. people who were really cool. Excuse me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I was invited. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, and so then I, I went um, just feeling like, oh, this is just going to be a singular thing. Um, and I go to the dinner. And in fact, when we had been talking about New Year's and our resolutions and our intentions, one of my friends had said, well, you need a bigger platform for your voice. You know, people need to hear from you more. And Ariana Huffington has just created a, um, a global network called Thrive in which people are able to communicate. She created the Huffington Post. Uh, she's an you know, enormous media mogul. Um, and I said, oh, yeah, 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 sure, no problem. I'll get to it at some point this year. Well, I show up at the dinner, and she's sitting literally across the table from me. And she gets up and she comes around and she's like, who are you? Like, you're super cool. I would like to get to know you. And I was like, yeah, that's right. I am cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it sparked off a relationship that became really quite a bond. You know, she advised me on many things. Um, and even in terms of like movement in my own career, you know, that sort of thing. And at one point, um, I was having a conversation with her because she had just joined the board of Uber. And uh, she was telling me about some of the challenges that they were having, both from a perception standpoint as well as some of the you know, challenges in breaking into uh, new territories and new cities. And she said, well, what would you do you know, if you were in that seat? And so I prattled off, you know, blah, 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 because I have a penchant to do that. <laughs> and she said, you know what, you should tell the CEO that. And I'm like, well, why, why would I? OK, sure. You know, so she invited me to her house. He happened to be in LA. It was supposed to be an hour lunch. It turned into an eight-hour conversation. And um, during the course of that, I just found myself you know, really enamored by the idea and the concept of Uber and what it could do in the world. You know, just the enormous growth. It's just such an exciting place. Um, and so I went back to my you know, office at Apple, very comfortably, doing my daily work. And I kept thinking about what I had told him you know, and what we had been discussing. And I thought, man, I got to go. I think I got to go. I got to go do that job. You know? And I think coupled with the fact that, again, um, right now we are in such a position, uh, a strong position for female leadership. And for me, having a chief seat in Silicon Valley, in the corporate world, means more than just the job. You know, it means the opportunity. It means um, visually representing what it can be like, that we can look like this, we can wear our hair like this, we can dress like this, we can wear stilettos like this, and still achieve. And so for me, it's very important um, that I show up as all of me. As you know? Bosoma. Correct. And pronounce it. Yes, Bosoma. It's correct. You know? And that for me, there's a, a real importance in not just sitting in the corporate boardroom, sort of hidden, but being very visual and very loud. Frontline. That's correct. So you went from being cool to being, becoming uber cool. <laughs> you know what? He gets 100 points. That's incredible. I'm going to use that. I'll credit you, though. I'll invoice you. <laughs> Is Uber misunderstood? I don't think it's misunderstood. Um, I think people really understand what the product is. I think the first time that you use the platform, you get it. It's like magic. You know, you don't necessarily need to understand all of the intricacies. But you know that you push the button and something happened. It's magical. You know, you don't need to be an engineer in order to get it. And for me, it's also the fact that um, it is a new way of being. You know, and that once people, it's like any habit, once people start using it, it becomes the thing to do. You know, and so 
I don't think the product is misunderstood. I think the intention of what we are trying to do in the world sometimes is misunderstood. Okay. Your daughter is here, Lael, yes. right? She's eight. Yes. Um, in 20 years, how will she go to work? Um, what will her workplace look like? Oof. What will her workplace look like? Well, hopefully it will be more diverse because of all maybe of us we, in maybe, this room. Maybe, maybe Lyle should give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But I, do, but I do have high hopes for her. You know, um, I think any parent does. You know, that you hope that the children, the, the world that your children grow up in is better than the world that you found. You know, and that perhaps the movements that you make prepare them to do greater than you've done. You know, I want the things that I do, the stages I'm on, uh, the places I go, the countries I visit, the vacations I take, I want those to be table stakes for her. I don't want those to be aspirations. Right. Yeah. Right. I want those to be table stakes. And, you know, considering that you're, you know, you're involved in the business, that's in the sort of cutting edge of technology, Silicon Valley and all this. In 20 years, what do you think her office will look like? What will she be working with? <laughs> well, God, you know, that's really tough because think about it. Only 10 years ago, the iPhone was created. Only 10 years. And smartphones erupted after that. And so to think that 10 years from now, we could have something that we can't even conceive of as we sit here is really difficult. I'm hopeful that because of the expanse of the experiences that she's getting, she will be better able to adapt to the growing change in the world because it's happening so quickly than perhaps many of the other people in the world that she will hopefully have an opportunity to do better because she is open to new ideas and new ways of working and new ways of thinking. And I really hope that we are able, each of us in this room, um, that we're able to do that for young people in our lives. They don't have to be our children. You know, that hopefully we are inspiring and opening up the concept to other children in our lives who will hopefully then take that further. That they will then be able to look at a new problem and not see it as a challenge. That they'll be open to it. That way, new concepts and ideas won't be foreign. That they won't stop and have to recalibrate and think about how am I going to get over this? You know, because everyone else is jumping faster over that thing. So my hope is that in 20 years, I may not be able to conceive what her workplace will look like because it hasn't been created, but that she won't slow down. Right. Lael, clear? <laughs> um, there are a number of people here who are in marketing. Um, what are your, some of your, the tips, the tricks that have worked for you? Mm. Right. Well, how many marketers are there? Are there a lot in here? All right. Well, don't be shy. Marketers can't be shy. That's Absolutely. the first thing. You know, exactly. We're the loud ones, uh, the proud ones, the creative ones. The arrogant ones. Yes. Yes. The artists. Um, you know what? I think the, the main trick for me, or the thing I go to most, is being able to trust my gut. You know, I think you can have all the, you know, book smarts that you want to. We should understand the foundations of what it takes to create marketing campaigns and, of course, the magic of, you know, making sure that our audience understands the message and the product, etc. Um, but really what it comes down to is the gut. You know, it's like if you're not pleased with the message or the idea, then how can your audience be? And so for me, that's the first thing. It's, you know, do I like it? And that may sound conceited, but it's not. Because if I don't like it, why would somebody else like it? You know, that's the first thing. Secondly, creating the authentic relationships. You know, not just with business partners, but with the audience itself. I'm talking personally. Mm -hmm. You know, getting to know people. Uh, because if you're supposed to be the master communicator, and you can't communicate to people, then how are you gonna do it on a massive scale? You have to be able to do it individually, have people trust you, you know, understand your thoughts and ideas, practice on people. You know, before I ever go into any boardroom to pitch an idea, 
I first practice it on everyone who will listen. <laughs> Even strangers in the grocery store. So what do you think about, you know, just to see what, what their thoughts and reactions are because quite honestly, you'll get the truest responses from people who don't owe you anything. Right. You know, when you get into the boardroom or into court, people want to be polite uh, and they may not like the idea or they may have challenges with it or uh, may want to um, dismantle it but won't tell you to your face. And so if you're able to get I that... I thought that only happened here. <laughs> Ooh, no, it happens everywhere. <laughs> Uh, but if you're able then to get that, you know, break down some of those barriers or address some of those concerns early on, by the time you get to the, you know, to the real room to sell it, you're pretty much scot-free. What influenced your career choice? Because you studied English. Yes. Right? And what, African-American studies? Yes. Correct? And uh, pre-med. Uh, and, and what? And, and pre-med. Pre -med. Yeah. Pre-med? Yeah. Okay. I did everything. Because right. I'm cool, like I said. <laughs> so you did that uh, at Wesleyan, right? Yes. Which is also where your father went. Yes. Uh, Dr. Yes. Apianda Arthur. Yes. Um, who, by the way, was a minister in um, President Hillary Mann's government. Yes. Uh, and your mom, by the way, is here. I'm yes. Hi, mom. I think you should stand up and show off your head. I know. Because she's so beautiful. Look at her. Yes. It shows off her beautiful face that much more. <laughs> yes, so career choice. Yes, so, um, you know, what's interesting. I grew up thinking that I was going to be a doctor um, because early on, uh, my parents moved us to Colorado Springs, Colorado when I was 12. And um, I was really good in sciences and math. Uh, and therefore, <laughs> very much like what we're just talking about with being rare, um, there weren't very many black girls in Colorado Springs, Colorado, who were doing well in sciences and math. And so many colleges, you know, were approaching me about, uh, you know, studies and wanting to, you know, attract me for those reasons. Uh, and so I went to school thinking that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but while I was there, it was really the extracurricular activities that got my attention, you know, the arts. So the concerts and the dance rehearsals and uh, the, you know, drawing and painting and all of those things that were more emotional in nature. And so when I was graduating, um, I decided to take a year, you know, to figure out what it is I truly wanted to do uh, before going on to medical school. And uh, I decided to do that in New York City. I didn't know anybody there really. Well, I knew one person, literally one person in the world uh, who had gone to my college and graduated a year before me. And I asked her if I could sleep on her couch while I figured out what I wanted to do. I said it was only gonna be three months. Well, no, first I said it was gonna be a month. And then it turns into three months. And then she was like, are you ever gonna get the hell out of here? But it worked, it was fine. Uh, but honestly, I feel like I kind of fell into the career because what I was following was the idea that, you know, pop culture, which as we said is music and entertainment, film, uh, poetry, you know, all of those things could really influence business. And thankfully, I saw that pretty early enough to be able to make a switch and decide to try it out for real. Did you struggle with that with dad and mom? A little bit, yes. Um, my dad definitely wanted me to go to graduate school. <laughs> I think as most parents, uh, he was concerned that I needed something to fall back on in case this pop culture thing did not work out, you know, or I the marketing imagine, thing did not know, work out. African parents, daughter, yeah. en route to becoming a doctor, yes. um, branches off into pop culture. Yeah, that was a hard sell, you know. All I said was, I just need a year. Just give me a year and I'm going to figure it out. And then it was the hustle you know, to actually make something happen. And I think we all need that. You know, we all need that. We need, we need almost like timetables, you know, to make you move fast, to and, give you urgency. And, what, and what, uh, what was the brick? What gave you the brick? Where did you see that little crack that you then yeah. pried open? Well, so uh, divine intervention, um, I got a job, well, when I first got to New York, I didn't have any money, um, and I started temping, 
with, uh, and so they would call me in the morning and say, go to this place, you're gonna fill in for somebody who's out sick or something, answer the phones. And uh, it so happened that Spike Lee's assistant, or he had just fired his assistant, and uh, they called me and said, you have to go to his office and answer the phones. He's just opened an advertising agency. Spike Lee's office? Yeah, Spike Lee's office. And so oh, I wow. put on the only suit I had, you know, threw on some little pearl earrings, snatched up my hair in a severe bun, you know, walked in the office with like my briefcase uh, to answer the phones. <laughs> and uh, he came out of his office and he was like, who they send me, Miss America? <laughs> and I was like, no, actually Miss Ghana, but that's okay. <laughs> You know what I mean? Uh, true story, actually. He'll tell you that himself. Um, in any case, he, I, I worked for him for four years, um, which meant that, you know, that little opportunity cracked open an opportunity for me to showcase what I was capable of. And my true break came when um, early on, or in the middle of that process of, of doing the advertising work with him and the agency, there were only five or six people at the agency, by the way. So everyone was wearing many hats. Uh, so it really gave me the opportunity at a young age to be able to throw my hands all the way in. Um, and one of the companies that we were gonna pitch for the business was PepsiCo. And Pepsi at the time was using a lot of musical artists to sell their product. Uh, and they sort of hit a rut. And they were looking for you know, someone who was interesting in pop culture to continue to put the message forward. Well, I was in New York, young and having a very good time, in the streets and such. And um, I'd run into quite a few people who were artists and stylists and all kinds of different things. And um, I'd run into Beyonce, who had just left Destiny's Child, or was in the process of leaving Destiny's Child. You run into Beyonce. Well, we're in the streets, man. We're in the clubs. You know, we're having a good time out here. And. Um, there was um, this moment in time, because I think now you look back and you think, oh, Beyonce, of course, like she's a mega superstar. You know, but at the time, she had just left Destiny's Child. And when you think about it, there aren't that many successful solo artists coming out of girl groups or boy bands, by the way. Like you can name them on like one hand. And so folks weren't actually giving her a chance. And she had just filmed um, Carmen the Hip Hopera on MTV. And uh, I thought it was really quite fascinating that you would take, no, I'm fine, thank you. Um, that you could take something as complex as opera and turn it into hip hop and serve it on MTV to a young audience. I just thought it was brilliant and fascinating, you know? So as we were pitching ideas back and forth in the office, it was Spike and the creative director and the art director and other folks, and you know, they were like naming all these you know, other artists who could come and sing and do like the classic drink shot, right? And I was like, well, what about Beyonce? Like, I just, I just saw her on the hip opera, you know? And I think she's so amazing, and it's such a complex idea. And Spike loves complexity, you know? So, of course, he was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, we should do that. And literally, we filmed that. We filmed her playing Carmen, doing a, a little bit of the hip opera, changed a few of the lyrics for Pepsi, filmed it, and it was a commercial. And that, that was the moment that I was like, you know what? Like, you can take some of these ideas that seem like maybe they're out here, and string them together and create something new and magical. Magic. Yeah. Yes, you may applaud. <laughs> it's okay. Tell me about uh, growing up and uh, pepper soup. Oh, yes. Okay, so guys, listen, because you guys will really appreciate this. Sometimes I tell it in front of an audience and people laugh, but you guys will really get it. So, I was 12, right? 13, 14, 15, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is not diverse at all, um, with classmates who really had only grown up in Colorado. And they weren't very used to people from different places. Um, my mother was adamant that in our house, uh, we were going to maintain our culture because she didn't want us to grow up uh, without it. She wanted us to be able to always come home to Ghana and feel at home speaking the language, eating the food, etc. So she strictly spoke Fanti in the house. Uh, she strictly made our food in the house. Um, and as a, a young teenager, um, I would often you know, invite friends over and I would be invited to their houses. Well, when I go to their house, they'd serve pizza or they'd you know, make some pasta 
or, you know, they'd have a casserole. And then when they would come to my house, my mom would be like, eh, you remember one in Pancha Cacra? <laughs> and I was like, ma, they can't, like they can't. The goat, like I can't with the goat, okay? And she was like, why? And then she made it worse, she would say, eh, if they eat pizza with their hands, they can eat fufu with their hands here too. <laughs> so, I was mortified. But now I'm so grateful, mom, thank you. And um, so it's been a wonderful journey, but uh, what, in 2011, mm -hmm. um, you lost your husband? 2013, yeah. 2013. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, um, we had been married for 10 years, uh, together for 13 years. Uh, at the time, both of us had enormous sort of skyrocketing careers. He was in advertising as well as a producer. Um, I had just come off of orchestrating uh, the NFL Super Bowl performance with Beyonce. Um, it was a magical time. You know, I was just, I felt like I was just hitting my stride. Uh, and he was doing really well too. Um, and we had, our, our daughter was four, and um, life was good. And in May of that year of 2013, just around her birthday, um, we discovered that he had cancer, a rare cancer, called Burkitt's lymphoma. And, um, and what does it do? It essentially attacks the lymph nodes. And so the way that the oncologist described it was like, it's like whack-a-mole, you know? It like, it pops up here, and then it pops up here, and then it pops up here. It just pops up all over the place. And, um, and there are tumors, little tumors. So we, unfortunately, we were not, you know, we weren't unused to cancer. Um, both of our mothers had battled cancer. So we went in saying, okay, what's the treatment plan? You know, is there surgery, chemo, radiation, all of those things? And uh, the oncologist first gave all the options. No surgery, but chemo and radiation. Uh, and then eventually said, you know what? None of the chemos are working. We're gonna try nine of them at one time. Um, none of that was working. And so in October of that year, um, he was told that he would not make it and that his cancer was gonna be terminal and that he only had a few weeks to live. Um, which was a shock to us because clearly he had just been diagnosed. We've been really fighting the good fight. Um, and it, it just, it created, back to the urgency that we were talking about before. You know, it created this urgency for us that we needed to do everything we wanted to do before he was gone. You know, meant that if he wanted to go camping with Leal, he needed to do it, like that day. There was no next week, there was no, you know, which he did. Uh, if he wanted to make up with a friend, I called them and said, hey, you better get over here. You know, and he did it. Um, if we wanted to make up for all of the little fights that we'd had along the years, we cleared the air. You know, it created this sense of purposefulness to do things today. Not to wait till next week, or wait till next year, but to do them right now. Because you really don't know how long we have. I think we all hear that, you know, constantly. You hear, we don't know how long you have, so you might as well do it. But the truth of the matter is that we really don't know. And when you do know, it gives you that much more urgency, fire, to do everything that you wanted to do. Unfortunately, um, by December of that year, then he had passed away, and uh, I was left devastated, you know, trying to figure out what happens next. Um, I was concerned, of course, about raising our daughter by myself, because that was not what I had planned to do. Um, I was also concerned about financing, you know, our life, uh, because like I said, she was four, and I was thinking, oh my God, you know, we have a whole lifetime you know, have to get her through school and through college and marriage and, oh my gosh, you know, what am I gonna do? Um, but for me, the real truth of the matter is that the grace that he left me with uh, and the gift was the urgency. You know, the need to never settle for the things that you think are impossible to attain or uh, the need to do it 
right now and to never take no for an answer. Do it right now. Oh. So how have you uh, managed emotionally? Oh, it's been tough. I mean, there are definitely you know, days when I have anxiety and extraordinary fear. Um, but also, it has uh, made me really vulnerable to uh, my friends and family, you know? I think before, I thought, oh, I can do anything by myself. You know what I mean? Like, I'm so strong. Look at me, look at these shoulders. They can like carry anything, you know? Uh, and I think we often take that burden on. You know, you think, oh, I'm gonna make my own way. You know, nobody's gonna give me anything, so I've gotta do it myself. Um, and it made me very humble uh, to have to ask for help. You know, in the times when I have to do anything, <laughs> you know, or need advice from friends because there's no one to sort of bounce it off of. Because um, he was also your friend. Yes, of course. Um, it meant that also I have to depend so much on my mother, you know, to help me in raising my daughter. And that, that changed our relationship, you know, that um, I looked at her in a new way. And for me, it has really been uh, an emotionally growing time because, like I said, there is this sense of purpose that probably was not honed very clearly before. Uh, but also this ability to be free with saying, I need help, help me. And knowing that that doesn't make me weaker because I ask. That it in fact makes me stronger because guess what, your village actually comes together. They actually want to help you. And so when you ask for it, you'll be surprised by how many people will come out the woodwork to help. Remember his last words to you? Oof. It's difficult because um, at the very end, he couldn't talk. Uh, he could, you know, the eye contact was there. And so we spoke volumes just through that. So I don't remember the exact last words, to be very honest. Uh, but we spent a lot of time just looking at each other. You know, there's a picture I have actually that I posted um, right before he passed away where it's like, you know, our foreheads are together because he couldn't, he couldn't really lift up his head. So he's like laying on the pillows and we're just looking into each other's eyes. It was like, I want to just make sure I soak up every little last thing that you got, you know? Did you ask sometimes, why me? Oh, yes. Why us? Oh, yes. I was, I was really, I just couldn't understand it, you know? Like, why? We've been so faithful. You know, we've been uh, so excited. We've been so successful. Why give us all of this and then snatch it away? Like, why would you do that? Um, I don't know if I found the answer yet, but I certainly know that it has made me a stronger person. And sometimes in those days when, you know, things are not going well or I feel a sense of struggle, I think about those days. You know, think about how far I've come from that moment. You know, I'm so thankful and so grateful that I'm actually able to sit here now and talk to you about this. I've come a long way. Well done. Thank you. So, um, Bozuma will take your questions. Um, so just show by hand and um, say your name and perhaps what you do. And, um, but there are a couple of questions that uh, um, I'll recommend you don't bother to ask because they may have uh, proprietary implications. For example, uh, Uber's future operations, that's proprietary. And, um, yeah, we're not giving away our trade secrets now, guys. <laughs> Come on. And also questions with legal implications. So, otherwise... Um, Yes, I'm open. I'm definitely open to questions. I guess mics are coming around. My name is Ashoka. I uh, work with Vodafone. So my question is, have you always been this bold and badass? <laughs> or did you grow into your confidence? And at which point did you realize that, yeah. yes, I am fabulous? <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you said that. Um, you know, I think it's, it's practiced, you know, like any good thing. Um, you do it a little bit at a time every day, you know, and eventually you just start walking into it. 
Um, it actually did start when I was a kid. Like I said, I gave you the example of what my mom used to do to us. <laughs> you know, I had three younger sisters, so there were four girls in my family. Um, she certainly, you should see that woman walk. She walks with a strut, you know? And there was nothing to do but emulate that. So I had a great role model. Um, additionally, you know, I think, again, sometimes we look at the struggles in our lives and we think that, oh my goodness, like, back to the question, like, why me? You know, why did this happen? Um, why am I, you know, one of the few black girls in this place where people don't understand where I come from, where they talk about my hair, where they, you know, like, why? But honestly, it made me have to go deeper to find my own self-worth, because no one was telling me that I was beautiful or that I was worthy or that I deserved a promotion, or that I deserved the money. You know what I mean? No one was telling me that. And so I had to practice that and figure out how every single time I got knocked down, I could then use that to come back stronger. I took them as lessons, really. That every time something happened, I would say, ah, it won't happen to me ever again. You know, it's always a lesson. I never ever look at those opportunities and say, oh man, well let me just go sit down in the corner and try something new. No, actually I'm not trying something new. I'm coming back stronger and I'm coming to get it. Okay. Right, my name is Antonio Koshiawusa. Um, I'm the chief executive of a Total Family Health Organization, um, a social marketing organization. I, I have three questions. Um, the first one is, does innovation have to be necessarily disruptive? Mm. The second question is, would you consider Uber to be a technology company or it's actually a transport company based on the, the recent declaration by the UK? Mm -hmm. And finally, what's your position on oh, the, wow. Me Too, yes. the Me Too campaign yes. um, and the implications for the employment of women yeah. in the future? Wow, okay, so you might have to hold on to that mic because I might need you to repeat some of the questions. So the first one was about innovation disruption, right? Yes. Um, I do believe that innovation needs to be disruptive. Because quite frankly, innovation means that you're taking something that exists or something that does not exist at all and changing the matter. It's never comfortable. You know, people often uh, will either balk at it, make fun of it, or say it's impossible. You know, and so true innovation needs to um, really change the matter. If it doesn't disrupt, it is sort of an iteration. It is actually not innovation. So that's a difference that I would mark. Um, your second question was about how Uber defines itself, right? As transportation or, or technology, technology company. company. Yeah. You know, I think the definitions are really tough. Again, the beauty of innovation is that you're creating something new, a new space, a new way to describe something. I don't know that we have the definitions because I don't think that Uber is done growing or done innovating that there are so many ways and so many places for the technology to go that we're still discovering, that we're probably gonna come up with new terms to describe what the businesses in this gig economy look like. You know, because you could ask if Airbnb is a hotel company, you know, but that doesn't sound right, right? It doesn't. Uh, and so how would you describe any of these gig economy companies uh, that are really creating new spaces for themselves? So I don't know that there's a clear answer. I would say it's a little bit of everything. You know, trying to create something totally new out of existing matters. Or whether Facebook is a publishing company. Correct, yeah, or a media company. Well, and, and actually, one thing I struggle with is the fact that innovation and disruption takes the lead before even, if you like, the politics and policy follows through. So there's always that internal tension as to, yes, in a sense, it's allowed for the innovation to take place. Then it looks like policy has to play catch up. Then you're pulled back. So at what point would there be some sort of a dialogue between the leaders of innovation and disruption and policy? Yeah. So that there is that stepwise good step towards ensuring that it's accepted. Rather than the gains come through, then it's actually eroded again with policy. Right. Okay, so I'll answer quickly so that we can get to some other folks sure. as well. Um, but truly, you know, the challenge with innovation is that it truly needs to change the way things are. And so when there are policies in place um, that don't wholly wrap around the innovation, you have to find the ways through that policy while still obeying the law, 
because law abiding, nobody wants to be breaking laws, um, and find ways to create new conversations. It's gonna take innovators on the other side of the table to also create the new policies to embrace the future. That's really what we're struggling with right now. I think for many tech companies and many companies who are innovative or disruptive, um, they're struggling with how to create that change, still help and develop communities and cities, and also encourage the folks who are creating the policies and the laws to come along on the journey and not to protect the old, but to move into the future. It takes bravery to do that. It takes breaking of some things that are comfortable in order to do that. Not everyone is in that comfortable space. And so sometimes you have to prove that it works in order for all of the rest to catch up. And then your last question about Me Too uh, is really significant. It ties back to the point I made about why I joined Uber in the first place, you know, about being a representation for not just black women or not just Ghanaian women or not just immigrant families and people, uh, but truly about this change in power. You know, that what you think is powerful may not be true. That it is time to, for us to change the dynamic. That what we thought was acceptable because of what it was created or the systems that created and the people in power need to break and it will take the collective voice. This is not actually a women's issue. This is all of our issue. And if we don't all get on board to change it, all of our communities will suffer. I think we're seeing the beginnings of it. It's nowhere near done. Next question. Um, I think those of us in the, dis in the diaspora are doing a great job um, owning our heritage and through the internet actually communicating a different narrative of Africa. Yes. What else do you think we can do um, to make more of those that are actually here haven't necessarily gone outside? Um, be proud and value who we are, independent of comparing ourselves to the Western world um, and not necessarily being better. Ooh, I love that question. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, I think it's so interesting that um, I talk about Ghana. I talk about Ghana so much that the actual fact is that because my dad went to Wesleyan University, I was actually born in Connecticut. Um, but I talk about Ghana so much and with so much pride that even on my Wikipedia page, it says I was born in Ghana. <laughs> That's how much pride I have about being from here. I think it's really important for us to show up as our whole selves all the time. It's the unique things about our culture and our being, our way of celebration, our way of greeting, our way of anything that makes us so special. And that, you're right, I think the internet and social media uh, has made for better communication where we can tell our own stories. I wish we would do more of that. You know, that we would loudly proclaim the things that are so unique to us. Recently, uh, Business Insider ranked you know, the best dressed executives in Silicon Valley, and yours truly won. <laughs> because, I mean, come on. Was there any competition, really? Um, but one of the things that they noted in the article when they were talking about my style was that she's often seen with Ghanaian accessories. And I, like literally, I was like, that was the best thing that I could have read. Uh, because for me, it was like, I'm not trying to be like other executives. I don't need to wear the power suit. I want to carry my full Angelina skirt to work. You know? I want to wear my hair in my beautiful cornrows. You know? I want to wear my bracelets. I want to wear my earrings. You know, I want to do the things that represent us. And also in the storytelling. I want to tell that story wherever I am. So when it comes up in conversations or in interviews, I always reference back. Uh, when I'm making a reference, again, about growing up, I always talk about my pepper soup experience. You know, just little cues that will allow for the pride to show through. And again, I really do hope that I am representing us well, 
and that other people will follow in that footstep too. Can we bring the microphone forward a little bit? Hi, Bozama. Hi. <laughs> a quick one. Are there any majority-owned Ghanaian companies that you are really proud of um, that you think are one day going to take over the world? Ooh, take <laughs> over the world. That is such a hard question. You know what? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know what, what I really find, um, it kind of relates to the last question about pride. Um, I really try to support businesses that are authentic to me that are Ghanaian made and owned. Um, so for instance, this lovely woman, uh, she has a company called Kua Designs. It's a purse company. Um, I carry that a lot of times on red carpets, you know, because why shouldn't it be on the Grammy red carpet with me, you know? And then I tag it so that other people will say, oh, where'd you get that bag? Right, exactly, her. You know, I think it's really important, again, that it does relate to the last question about pride, in that we need to be able to support companies, businesses uh, that are of our own interest. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I actually find it so funny when people are like, oh, well, I don't want to seem like I'm too biased, you know, around, you know, where I'm from, or, you know, may seem like some sort of, you know, improprietary type of thing. And I'm like, but why? That's the whole point. You know, you get to a certain level and you pull other people up with you. You know, if you don't do that, then everybody gets left behind. And what, you're the only one shining out there? Guess what, you're going to fall someday, so then you'll be there by yourself. Why don't you need some people up there to catch you when you do fall? Yeah. So yeah, maybe Kua will become the next like Vera Wang. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Yolanda. I'm the CEO of Vodafone. Um, firstly, well, hello, I'd like boss. Hi, yeah. hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> firstly, I mean, it's first to say thank you for everything you've done because you're actually marketing it up there for all the women and for all African women. I'm not Ghanaian, but I'm really, really proud when I see women like you actually making it and actually also trying to open the way for other women to actually pass through. So well done first for that. And that's why Vodafone is so well represented because Amen. we said we actually want to show emotional and physical support for women uh, in, in business and who are really making it. Um, the, my question is uh, around Uber. Spent some time in Silicon Valley in the last few weeks and you know, I say tech gigs are taking over the world. I mean, they've become new bosses uh, five years ago, 10 years ago. We didn't have people in technology actually heading up the biggest companies in the world. It was yeah. the marketing people, it was the finance people, it was all those kind of stuff. Yeah. How is this going to actually change how we perceive the world in the future, mm -hmm. where companies that are not necessarily producing stuff actually being the trillion dollar companies yeah. uh, in the world. So your top five will, will actually become that. Yeah. And then the second question is around, how will machine learning actually impact what you do? Is uh, marketing becoming an art or a science? Mm. Is, it, is that whole thing around AI gonna actually change yeah. how we do what we do today? Right. Yeah. Ooh, you guys do not have easy questions, man. <laughs> okay, so um, about sort of leadership and uh, you know, folks who are in tech leading, you know, the biggest companies and what does that mean? You know, I really feel that at this point, you know, some of the questions about innovation, those type of things are true to how we behave as well, right? I was recently asked a sort of a difficult question, similar to your difficult questions, um, <laughs> about, you know, what happens to I any driver once you know, driverless cars or those types of things become an everyday thing. Um, and my question to them, and this was specific in the US, I said, well, what happened to the milkman? You know, there used to be a milkman who would come around and deliver milk to everyone's doorstep. What happened to that person? Did he become the Amazon delivery guy? You know, what happened to that job? And so to me, it's about all of us understanding what is happening in the future and not being afraid of it. You know, understanding how to adapt to it, how to find our talents and apply them to the new world. Because again, we don't want to be left behind. We shouldn't be left behind. And I don't believe that there's only one way of doing anything. 
that it will take all of our collective talents in the many ways that they show up in order to actually produce these companies. You know, I think Uber is actually a very good example where you can't just have one type of person running a company. You need many different types of people. You know, you need someone who's creative to come in and help shape a brand because the engineers can't do it. They just don't think that way. That's no shade to them. They just can't. I don't code. You know? But we do need each other in order to create a balanced world. And so I don't think that the jobs are necessarily leaving or that the tech giants are then going to rule the world. I think we will all be doing our roles just a little bit differently. And we actually need to be visionary in seeing how we're going to participate in the future. Um, and then your second question, art and science. Yes. I love that question, because I really do think it's a com it is somewhat of a combination, but I lean more towards the arts, you know? And again, this comes into the, you know, well, who's doing this side of it versus this side of it? Um, a lot of tech companies are obviously using performance marketing, growth marketing as the basis for a lot of the communication. You know, what's gonna perform better? What's gonna get me a great return on investment? You know, if I buy this many, you know, these banner ads, it's gonna get me this many clicks. Well, you can do all the math all you want to, but if you have the wrong message at the wrong time, then it's not gonna help you. You know, I have um, two very special friends here, Boris Kojo and Nicole Ari Parker, uh, who are, yes, that's good, let's go broad. Yes. They're here with their lovely children, Nico and Sophie. Um, but it's interesting, because we just did a partnership together, uh, because one of the things that, you know, I saw when I came first into Uber was this need to humanize the brand, right? So I think that goes to the question previous also about is it a tech company? Well, no, it's a human company. You know, they're human beings driving the cars. Mm -hmm. And they're human beings who are creating the software. And they're human beings who are writing the ads. And they're human beings who are serving the lunch. It is a human company. And so how do you express humanity? Well, Boris and Nicole happen to have a very popular um, Facebook live program, I would call it in which people watch them talk about many different things. They were in cars. They also had a talk show. Obviously, they're beautiful actors um, and real creative people who understand how to communicate to people. And so we did a partnership in which they then, and this was recent, this was just a few weeks ago, where they sat in Ubers and had the audience, so you engage the digital audience, to tell them where to go. The campaign was called Where To. And event, you know, essentially, they would just write it into the comments or you know, give them advice on where to go, and they would plug it into the app, and off they would go. It created many adventures. They went to like five cities in five days, I think. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry about that. That was really hard for you. <laughs> um, but they did beautifully. But my point is that AI wouldn't have been able to tell me that these two beautiful people are really engaging and really lovable and funny and that they would be able to communicate some of the harder tech ideas, like plugging in an address to some place you don't know, and that you'd be able to go and have a good time. That's what I want to communicate. They did that brilliantly. But AI would have never been able to tell me that. And so it requires some heart and spirit. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Uh, Thank you. Just a couple more, and then we'll be done. Um, do you have uh, Me Too stories, too? I think everyone does, yeah, yeah. That you would share? Well, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's quite obvious. There are so many um, microaggressions as well as the you know, stories that we've been seeing. I think the microaggressions are things like you know, when somebody talks over you in a meeting or when somebody tries to mansplain something, you know, or when you are passed over for a job that you know you are more qualified for, or you're given an offer for less money than you know you deserve. You know, these are all instances, I feel, where they are microaggressions and they may not be categorized as harassment, but they are harassment because they kill our spirit. And so to me, when people say, oh, well, I've never experienced it, I'm like, really? Because I think we all have, you know? And it's not, you know, it is, obviously happening to a majority of women, but I don't think it's a women's problem. It's a man's problem, and the men need to fix it. And so to me, there is a real need for solidarity, not just for women to do hashtag me too, 
but for the men to join the conversation. I want more men to come out and talk about that, witnessed issues and situations that they've seen and speak up. You know, you don't have to out the woman, but say you saw it. You know, somebody needs some backup. And so why is it that the women are the only ones speaking? I think men start, need to start coming out and telling stories. Tell on your homeboy. Tell what he did. Yes, sir. <laughs> Do you have any stories? that you can share? How, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Finally, where is Bosma going? Mm. Ooh, towards world domination, baby. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I am, I am so thankful to be on this journey. You know, I have extraordinary faith in God and in the journey that has been created specifically for me. Um, I am not trying to follow anyone else's path. And so for me to be arrogant enough to assume that the dreams I have dreamed are as big as the ones God has for me uh, is inconceivable. So I won't pretend to have any kind of idea about where I'm going. I am fully trusting God in the next steps of my life. Bozoma St. John, Pathmaker, Uyikwain. Amen. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for this platform. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 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 And then Yamia Tim Pomusa, whom I'm assigned a man's answer to what do go. And then Yamia, when you are about Tampa, Mamma, what you've heard, you need to die, 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 die